So far, I've talked about the best and worst free agent signings in this 2015 NBA offseason. It's time now to shift my focus to the re-signings, those players that ended up agreeing to terms to stay with their current teams, and talk about the best and worst of those moves as I see them. Now, first thing to keep in mind is, again, this is only re-signings. I've already done the players that went from one team to another. This is just strictly focusing on the players that re-upped with their team for varying lengths and different dollar amounts. And with these deals, some of the best are the max players, that got the star money. Some of them are role players. It's a combination of things that could be based off of the money, uh, where the player was in their career, what that team was looking at, you know, any number of things. And similar in the next video, where this video is going to focus on the best of those, the next video, the worst of those, it could be bad because they gave somebody, well, in my opinion, all of them way too much money. But some of them it could be for role players. Some of them it could be giving max money to second tier players. All of that type of stuff. So let's go ahead then and talk about what, in my opinion, were the 10 best re-signings in this 2015 NBA offseason. Number 10, I'll go with a role player, Alexis Agensa for the New Orleans Pelicans. You're getting a guy with size, a legit 7'1", 7 7'2", 7 that can bring at least a little something to the table and, in my opinion, play better alongside Anthony Davis than Omar Ashik did. You were able to get a Jinsa for four years, $20.2 million, basically $5 million a season. For a legit, at the very worst, a legit backup center at the NBA level. And I would argue a borderline starter who's a better fit to start alongside Anthony Davis. That's a steal. In the current economic marketplace of the NBA, being able to re-sign a Jensa for basically $5 million a year, and not just for a one-year deal, but for the next several years to come, that was a huge bargain in my opinion, again, based off of the market conditions and circumstances and what we've seen given out to certain players, one of the best deals in this free agency period uh, for a role player for a team, and that has to be to the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, number nine, Chris Middleton of the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, some might question this a little bit because for all intents and purposes, Middleton was a bit of a one-year wonder for the Milwaukee Bucks, and they may wonder, well, nobody else actually offered him that. Why would you sit there and give him the type of deal that you did, five years, $70 million? And I understand that. However, you're also talking about a Middleton who's 23 years of age, who showed what he could do last season. Again, another one of those multi-positional type of players. The Milwaukee Bucks, in a decent salary cap situation, had the luxury here, I think, to overpay a bit now uh, to lock up somebody that is young, that has an offensive skill set that that team needs, has, again, multi-positional versatility, which is something that Jason Kidd really values and that organization values. And now you've locked him in another year or two down the road. His value on the market, especially the way this market is trending in the NBA, could have trended towards him being a max player. So being able to lock him up for $14 million a year seems a bit crazy now, and I understand that. But I think it's a good deal that has the potential to be an even better deal down the road, or at least, if nothing else, still stay a good deal. Number eight, Mike Dunleavy in the Chicago Bulls came to terms on a three-year $14.4 million deal, where the third year is only partially guaranteed. Mike Dunleavy played very well, in my opinion, for the Bulls this past season, especially come playoff time. He had some really nice performances, a guy that could space the floor, a guy that was a bit of a better rebounder and, frankly, defender than he was given credit for. Gave the Bulls team a little bit of an edge, something that they needed. And when you get a guy like this, again, a valuable role player, again, even being a guy in his mid-30s, locking him up for the next couple of seasons for less than $5 million a year, a very affordable figure when it comes to the salary cap, basically giving him pretty much your mid-level exception, you know, that, that's a pretty good deal. Guys like Dunleavy on the open market could, in theory, potentially command a little bit more. Not a ton more, but a little bit more. So I thought it was a good bargain and a really good decision by the Bulls to prioritize bringing a Dunleavy back into the fold because there was no reason to want to watch him leave and go somewhere like Cleveland. Number seven, Corey Brewer and the Houston Rockets. Three years, $24 million. The dollar amount might seem a bit high, but again, based off of some of the contracts we've seen given out to role players, I think Corey Brewer's $8 million a year is very reasonable, especially when you look at his fit in Houston with the system that they run. 
He brings a lot of versatility to the table on the perimeter. You can play him at the two, you can play him at the three. He can defend twos, he can defend threes. He's a guy that really fits well into kind of their free-flowing open floor system. A really good fit. And, you know, when I look back at, let's say, last year when the Celtics gave Avery Bradley $8 million a year, I think Corey Brewer is a better player and worth that money more than an Avery Bradley is. So it's not a bad deal, especially when you look at the Rockets. You want, you you found a little bit of something later on in the season. Yes, you've lost Josh Smith in free agency, but to be able to bring back Corey Brewer and a Patrick Beverly as well, it's a team that's going to have some chemistry and some continuity, which is a good thing heading into this upcoming season. Number six, Tobias Harris with the Orlando Magic for four years and $64 million. I don't nearly have as much of a problem with this type of max deal or close to max deal compared to some of the other ones I've seen that I'll be talking about in the next video. I look at Tobias Harris again. You're talking about a wing player in his early 20s who has shown you some potentially all-star potential. Worst case scenario might develop into a 19 or 20 point per game score in the league. And when you look again at the market and the types of contracts that players are given, you just saw the Dallas Mavericks give Wesley Matthews almost $18 million a year in his late 20s, coming off of a torn Achilles. And he's not the same player Tobias Harris is. Now you look at Orlando with a team with Alfred Payton and Victor Oladipo, and then you look at re-signing Tobias Harris and keeping him in the fold long term. Aaron Gordon and Mario Hazonia. This is a young athletic team, especially on the perimeter, that can get after you, that can defend. And a guy like Tobias Harris was important long term for them because they needed that guy that could give them some offense on the outside. And Tobias Harris does that. And again, I don't think this is a terrible contract. When that salary cap goes up, maybe next season, and there's even more money available, this contract could look even better for the Orlando Magic. Uh, number five, Damian Lillard for the Portland Trailblazers, five years and $120 million. Once LaMarcus Aldridge was leaving town, you had to make sure that you did what you were already planning to do, and that was make Damian Lillard your franchise player. You had to make sure you didn't risk losing him long term. You had to get this deal done, and the Blazers got that deal done. Now it's Damian Lillard's show, it's Damian Lillard's team, and the Portland Trailblazers at least keep themselves a viable franchise for the next several years. And if push comes to shove at some point in time and they decide they need to move on from Lillard based off of what he can do and the type of player that he is, there will be a team, if you can make it work, that will be more than willing, probably more than one team willing, to take on that contract. So... You know, the Blazers had to do it. To me, that was actually the number one priority of their offseason. It wasn't trying to re-sign LaMarcus Aldridge. It was making sure that they didn't pussyfoot around, that they didn't drop the ball, that they got this deal done with Damian Lillard. Then they got it done. Number four, I got to go with Kawhi Leonard and the San Antonio Spurs. Five years and $90 million. You're, you're talking about a wing player, former NBA Finals MVP, that is going to be along with Marcus Aldridge, the future of the San Antonio Spurs. And while he's not a 25-point-per-game scorer, you look at what Kawhi Leonard does on both ends of the floor. He's a max player. He deserves max money, based especially off of the current environment of the NBA. And being able to give him max money, and that type of max money is not even $20 million a year, it's not that bad of a contract in terms of the percentage of the cap, salary cap space it's going to take up for the next several years, especially when you consider you know, the fact that this is a team that's going to be contending for a championship now and maybe long term, along with LaMarcus Aldridge in the fold as well. I love the fact that the Spurs are able to get this Dunk. Kawhi Leonard is that new prototype San Antonio Spurs player, similar to how Duncan, Parker, and Ginobili have been for so many years. He's that guy to ultimately carry that torch. And it was well done on the Spurs' part to be able to bring him back long term into the fold and bring in LaMarcus Aldridge as well. Number three, Jimmy Butler. Of my Chicago Bulls, five years and $95 million. It was never really a doubt whether or not Jimmy Butler was going to be back with the Bulls this upcoming season, but I think there was some doubt in terms of whether or not he would sign some long-term type of deal or would he potentially gamble on himself for a year and hit free agency next year when the salary cap could go up $15, $20 million, if not more, and hit the market as an unrestricted free agent. Well, the Bulls did what they needed to do. They didn't take any chances. They let Jimmy Butler kind of find out what the reality was of the situation, what the marketplace was like, and the fact that they could match whatever the fuck they wanted to match. This was the best that he was going to get, and he didn't sit there and gamble on himself again. 
He could have taken the qualifying offer for one year and four, it was four, four, four point four million dollars. But at the end of the day, how much more would that max contract have been in another year, and would he have ever recoup that money? At some point in time, you've got to cut your losses and say that's still a shit ton of guaranteed money. And the Bulls had to sit there and say. We can't risk losing our best player on both ends of the floor. We have to get him re-signed long-term, and it got done. Now the Bulls are at least a viable team for the next several years because Jimmy Butler is in the mix. And again, similar to like I talked to, to Damian Lillard, if it ever got to a point in time where a guy like Jimmy Butler needed to be traded for any number of reasons, based off of what he brings to the table, that salary in two or three years could potentially be very movable, give the team still quite a bit of flexibility, and there will be plenty of teams that will be interested in taking on a guy like Jimmy Butler even at this salary. Number two, Marcus Gasol, the Memphis Grizzlies. I don't think there was ever any doubt that he was you know, going to resign with Memphis. There was no doubt that he was going to get more money from them than anybody else. There was no doubt that he was going to get max money. But you're talking about, at this moment to me, the best center in the NBA and the identity, the face of the Memphis Grizzlies franchise, you know, and, he, and he's staying there. Sometimes it's not the sexy moves that are the best moves. Sometimes it's those logical, common-sense things. Marcus Saul is a beast. He's an all-star. He's arguably the best center in the league, in a league that lacks in quality centers. He's the face of your franchise. He deserves a max deal. You can give him a max deal. So you just give him a max deal. You know, and you have to think at some point in time that the Memphis Grizzlies do ever find themselves in a situation where they need to be players in the free agent market. You know, having a guy like Marcus Gasol in the fold long term makes you a viable um, landing spot or destination for free agents. And again, sometimes this matters too. Similar as I talked about with Damian Lillard, Jimmy Butler. Um, you know, Marc Gasol, again, same type of deal. If the Memphis Grizzlies ever had to blow it up, if they ever had to sit there and start it over, somebody would be willing to take on Marc Gasol's contract. But the number one best re-signing in the NBA offseason to me has to be Anthony Davis and the New Orleans Pelicans. Yes, he's getting close to $30 million a year with a five-year $145 million contract. And again, a lot of these deals, keep in mind, have a player option somewhere in there on the last year. But it didn't matter for New Orleans. This is your guy. This is your franchise. Anthony Davis at some point in time probably becomes the best player in the league. And if he doesn't become the best player in the league, he's probably already top five now, if not top three. He's most certainly going to stay there for the next several years to come. The second a guy like Anthony Davis can get a long-term extension, if you're the New Orleans Pelicans, you need to go on and do that. And that's exactly what they did. And again, looking at a team that, you know, you've got one of the very best players in the NBA in the fold for many years to come. When it comes time to go out in free agency and maybe try to get to that next level and become a contending team, there are players that you would have to think are going to want to come play with the Unibrow. They're going to want to come play with Anthony Davis. Worst case scenario, the New Orleans Pelicans have a box office bonanza for the next four to five years, and they have one of the most marketable players in the league, which is going to do them wonders in terms of merchandise and all of that jazz, ticket sales, you name it. But it's also going to probably assure them uh, that they'll be at least sniffing the playoffs in the Western Conference for the next several years to come. And that, to me, was the best. There were several good re-signings for different reasons, some role players, some stars, and some superstars. But when you're talking about, you know, Anthony Davis making sure you're not taking any risks, you're not running a chance of losing him in free agency, you cut out all the bullshit so that way there's no animosity, you make sure you make a statement, you say, that's our guy, and we're in it with him, and let's go from there. That, to me, was the number one best re-signing out of all of these good re-signings that I listed in this year's NBA free agency offseason period.